and today's feature presenter is Bill Burnett. Bill is an adjunct professor of mechanical engineering and the executive director of the design program at Stanford University. He directs the undergraduate and graduate programs in design and teaches at the D School. Bill received his Bachelor's of Science and Master of Science in Product Design at Stanford and has worked in startups and Fortune 100 companies, including seven years at Apple designing award-winning laptops and a number of years in the toy industry designing Star Wars action figures. He holds a number of mechanical and design patents and design awards, and in addition to his duties at Stanford, he is on the board of Voss, a socially responsible fashion startup, and advises several other startup companies. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Bill. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. We, we have, there we go. There's the first slide. So today we're going to talk about um, this idea of called we call designing your life, which is sort of an interesting um, uh, sort of grand claim. Can people actually use design thinking to design their lives? Um, the, for those of you who are familiar, I'm sure many of you are with the design thinking ideas, the diagram that we have for our process says, you know, the design thinking process starts with empathy for users. Let's say we're trying to come up with a new kind of mobile phone or a new uh, application for dieting or something. We talk to users. We figure out what they really need. We typically redefine and reframe the problem a bunch of times until we're sure we've got it right. Come up with lots of ideas in the ideation phase. And then we build and test, prototype and test our way forward. And that's, the, that's just that's the way design thinking works. It's a very iterative and generative process. Companies like IBM and Apple and, and other people, you know, are using this process to innovate products. So the, the you know, the kind of the question becomes, gee, this, this is a human-centered problem-solving approach. Can we apply design thinking to this wicked problem of designing maybe your job or redesigning your career and potentially even addressing the issue of how do I have uh, you know, a meaningful life. And so about 10 years ago, um, my co-founder of the Designing Your Life Lab, the D-Life Lab at Stanford, Dave Evans and I, started, started a conversation about this idea. Could you apply design thinking to the wicked problem? Wicked problem is a technical term. So problems that are open-ended and they, they're hard to solve. And as soon as you solve them, new problems emerge. Could you so use design thinking to work on things like having a meaningful life? And it really gets back to the question that we get asked in office hours and we get asked when we're doing workshops and seminars. It's the one question that doesn't ever seem to go away, and that's the, what do I want to be when I grow up question. Now, if we were live, I'd ask you to all raise your hands if you've ever been asked this question. I think 100% of all humans on the planet, in our, every culture I've done this workshop in, in, in Portugal and Spain and Italy and in Taiwan and Korea and China, Everybody says, yeah, people always ask me, what do I want to be when I grow up? And sometimes I ask myself that question. So here's our first re reframe. And design thinking is big on coming up with a new way of looking at the problem. We call it a reframe. Uh, we don't ever want you to grow up, at least if growing up means losing that childlike curiosity about that world, that hunger to learn new things. Um, so we reframe this problem as, what do I want to grow into as I explore the rest of my life? And we've been doing um, DYL workshops based on the book that came out in September all over the country. And we haven't yet to meet anyone. We had, we had in the very first workshop we did for the Stanford Alumni Association in New York, we had a woman sitting front and center in a room of 350 alums. She was from the class of 1950. She was 80 some years old. And she thought the rest of her life was going to be very, very interesting. So we have never met anybody who doesn't think that it would be worth having some tools and ideas about how to explore this growing into the rest of their lives. So that's our reframe. And you know, we've been teaching this class at Stanford since 2006, so a little more than 10 years. And we started out with just a class called Designing Your, actually we started out with a class for just my, the kids in my major, the design students called uh, the Designer's Voice. But that very quickly became a general class for everyone at the university, engineers, non-engineers, science majors, history majors, um, people from the drama department, people from the art department, people from computer science, all the students across the board. And we have a class for seniors called Designing Your Life because they're the ones that with the, the kind of the biggest pain point. They're about to launch into the world and they've never been anything but a student before. And then we were asked to do a class for uh, fresh Stanford freshmen. So we have a Designing Your Stanford for freshmen. We say don't do, don't do Stanford like you did high school. It's a much bigger experience and you don't want to be so ballistic. 
Um, you don't want to just pick a major and go, you know, because that's not utilizing Stanford for all of the resources that it has. And then we also do with classical design professionals for master students and PhD students who are thinking about, you know, do they want to go into academics or do they want to do a career in industry? And the same ideas and tools apply to all of these people. They just have slightly different framing questions because they're at different stages in their lives. We also do this off campus with mid-career professionals and and uh, we just, uh, the, the, the director of our lab, the managing director of our lab, Kathy Davies, just did a Designing Your Life for Women weekend down at Asilomar on the coast here in, in, in the Bay Area. So there's lots and lots of interest in this stuff. And we've actually measured the results around whether or not taking the class, you know, has an impact on people. And I dug out this old poster. This is a very busy slide. I apologize. But it's, what, it's normally a, a big, you know, sort of, you know, three foot by two foot poster given at a conference. Um, and this was the work of Lindsay Oishi, who was a PhD candidate studying the class. And one of the things she did was she studied people who took the class. Uh, there's a random group of students who were her controls. And a group of students who um, wanted to take the class but couldn't get in, who just had intention but didn't have the actual intervention of the class. Um, the class outcomes were, if you're looking at that little yellow box in the middle, um, the confidence to explore careers and make good decisions went way up. The belief in these career myths, what I'll call just functional beliefs, and I'll talk about those in a second, went way down. And the ability to identify and achieve specific occupational goals went way up. And if that little chart on the far right there with the, the red, uh, green, and blue bars uh, as an indication, people grew in their flexibility to have new ideas and in their creativity to imagine new possible futures. So it's pretty clear that if you just take the class, or in this case maybe read the book, that you can have you know, a higher confidence, that you can choose well as you move forward in your career, that you will be more inventive and creative if you practice the techniques taught in, in the class. And it was really kind of nice to hear that you know, on, a, on a scientific basis with a controlled study we could have that kind of an impact, you know, on a student's outcome. Part of that was we get rid of what, what psychologists call dysfunctional beliefs. The first one we try to blow up is this belief that the organizing question for your life is what's your passion? Again, if we were live, I'd say how many people have been asked this question in the last month or two and I'm I, experiences any evidence, 90% of you would say, oh yeah, this question comes up all the time. Um, it's a terrible question, we think, in, for a couple of reasons and, and here's the data on it. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not going to say that if you, if you knew at age five you wanted to be a ballerina and you are now dancing, you know, with the New York Ballet Company, awesome that you found your passion early and you tracked to it and you achieved it. But the data says that only 20% of the population can actually answer this question. Um, Bill Damon, who wrote a fantastic book, Path to Purpose, Bill is the head of the Center for the Study of Adolescence here at Stanford and a top researcher in the field of careers, purpose, meaning. Um, you know, he did a pretty extensive study and very few people, you know, one out of five can say, I know what I want to do and I'm kind of going for it. Everybody else either has many things that they're interested in or none, no one thing that rises to whatever the level of passion is. So we're un uncomfortable with the technique that says, okay, you come to the front of the line and I say, what's your passion? You say, I don't know. And I say, okay, go back on the line. When you figure it out, come back and I'll work with you. That just, is, that just doesn't seem fair. And people who uh, people come to us all the time and say, you know, I should have had, I should have identified a passion by now, but I don't have one, and they feel like they've done something wrong. And the data is, you're not wrong, you're normal. So um, don't worry about this question. Uh, Cal Newport wrote a book called uh, "Be So Good They Can't Ignore You" or something to that effect, in which he tracked this same thing. And he says, look, passion is the outcome of working hard in a field that you love and discovering that it is truly your calling. It's an end point. It's not a starting point. So if you can if you take one thing away from the talk today, blow up this belief that you have to have a passion. It's not true. Second dysfunctional belief is, well, you should, be, you should know where you're going by now. And if you're not, you're late. And, and, um, and I, when I grew up, that was 25. By 25, you were supposed to have a sort of primary relationship, uh, you know, uh, in the oven and ready to go. And you were supposed to have a job that was the thing you were going to do for the rest of your life. And if you didn't have it by 25, you were late. There was something wrong with you. Now my students would probably say 30, but the point is it's a ridiculous question. There's going to be more than one of you in there anyway. You're going to have multiple careers. You can't be late because you have what, late for which career? The, the second one, the third one. Um, the first one is often exploratory in, in nature. 
And so the fact that you're trying lots of things is the new normal. There's no such thing as being late. The third one, you know, which, which probably is the most dysfunctional one, is that you should be optimizing the very best version of you. There is one singular version of you applied in this question, and you should find it. And if you don't find it, then you are not actually having the best possible life, and you are settling for something less than that. And I run into this with lots of people that I talk to in, in our little mini workshops, where they're like, you know, I picked something, but it's really not what I wanted, but I can't change, and it's not the best. And we're like, well, well, one, you can change. Two, it's never too late. And three, this idea of best implies some singular path. I mean, look, all of us, if we looked backwards in our lives, and, we, and I asked you to honestly tell me, how did you get here? How did you get to the, the thing you're doing today? You would have to argue that some of it was choice. I made some good choices along the way. Some of it was, hey, some opportunities showed up. I put myself in a context where those opportunities might happen, and, then, and that was great. And a bunch of it is luck. You know, I'll tell you my story. I ended up a professor at Stanford. I never planned to do that. Um, I grew up in the East Coast in Boston. I was just back there recently and reminded, that, reminded me that everybody thought I was going to go to Harvard or Yale. And when the letter for Stanford came, and I didn't even know that what Stanford really was. This was a long time ago before you know, the Internet and, and famous colleges. The letter from Stanford came, and I picked it so I could get as far away from my parents as possible when I went to college. That was my sole criteria. I came here as a physics major. I washed out of physics in about two quarters and then decided I'd invent my own major, physics and art, because I was always an artist. When I went to declare that major, I discovered that this campus has the one singular program in the entire academic world called product design, which combines physics, art, uh, psychology, anthropology, and a bunch of other things that I was deeply interested in. It was dumb luck that I ended here. Had I gone to Harvard, I'd been a lawyer. I always wanted to be a lawyer. I never wanted to be an engineer. That said, I made some good choices, and I put myself in the context where those choices could get realized. There was no one best version. There's an old expression in business, you know, good is the enemy of better, better is the enemy of best. You should always try to do your best. Uh, Dave reframes that as the unavailable best is the enemy of all the available betters. There's so many other ways that you can experience, you know, a life that's meaningful and a career that is moving in a direction that, that makes sense to you, that has a purpose. But getting rid of this notion that if you don't have the right one or the best one or the only one, that you're somehow settling, which is a terrible feeling, um, getting rid of this notion tends to release people from a lot of in action and start them towards doing stuff. In the class, we have a, 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 a we kind of support the design thinking uh, model with two things. We talk call about meaning the meaning making layer in all the research we did to create the class. We did a lot of research in the positive psychology literature and general in, in the literature of healthy people and what makes healthy people happy, um, and also liter the the, so the literature and research on the students themselves. We went and did lots of need finding. Everybody says the goal of this experience, the goal of this experience of life is to do something meaningful. I want my life to have a purpose. I want to know what it was for. So we have a meaning-making layer we call the point of view, the work view, and the world view. And we have all these assignments around the, that layer. And then we have what we call um, you know, the design thinking piece where we teach brainstorming and mind mapping and, and reframing and all the mindsets of a designer. And, and then we have the discovery and support layer where we talk about the practices you have to have so that you are ready to make good decisions. How do you discern things? How do you know and make decisions about things with something other than just logic, uh, emotional uh, intelligence, kinesthetic intelligence, just other ways of knowing? We talk about the importance of mentors and community because you can't do this by yourself. Um, we encourage people to work through the book in design teams, and we're tracking over 400 teams now that are doing that as like a book club or design club. Um, you have to do this together. So this is kind of the visual syllabus, if you will, of the class. I don't have time to do all of these things, but I want to touch on, on three that I think are, are kind of fun and important. One is this idea of flow. Um, a guy named Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, um, who's got the hardest to pronounce name in psychology, um, his colleague of Martin Seligman wrote a book called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. Now, you've all been in states of flow. You might call it something different, the zone, if you were an athlete. Um, you know, or just in the moment if you, if you like that framing. But it's the thing where you're doing something, you're working on something, 
Time stands still. You're completely involved in the thing. You have a sense of energy. He calls it a sense of ecstasy about that. There's some inner clarity about the, the purpose of the thing you're doing, and um, people experience a sort of a timeless, you know, serene moment. Um, pretty high, high things. He has, this, he has a model, what he calls the flow zone, or the flow channel, where uh, the, the challenge that you're facing is, is tough enough so that it's really challenging your skills. But it's not so challenging that you've, you've moved over into anxi anxiety or distress, like this is too hard, I'm not doing it well. And it's not so easy that you're getting uh, bored with the task. So you're allowed to hyper-focus and pushing your skill just to the edge of the, of the limit of the task you're doing. Now, you know, athletes will do that in a, in a moment in athletics where they just feel like they're totally connected to the team or to the moment or, or to the, or knew where the ball was going to be. Um, scientists experience this by just going into the lab and writing things on a whiteboard and, and just kind of not even exhausting themselves, which is just being completely inside the problem-solving moment. Um, I have moments of, of this when I'm teaching. I have moments of this during, um, you know, conversations in office hours. But I can also have these in very simple moments, like um, I like to cook and, you know, sort of chopping, chopping onions, doing my mise en place for the meal, getting everything prepped and ready. That's a flow moment for me because I feel competent in the kitchen and I'm trying new things and I'm wanting to, you know, wanting to make a, a, a wonderful meal. So. Our, our idea about this is that you should be finding yourself in your career and in your life in moments of flow every week. Um, if you're not finding that to happen, there's one of two things that are possible from the literature and from um, Mahaley Check something High's work. One is you're not noticing. Uh, a lot of our lives are so busy now and we're doing so much that we just don't notice stuff. Um, and so keeping a journal, which is one of the you know, principal practices we teach our students, is a good way of just bringing things to your attention. Now, there's two ways of noticing. One way of just being in the moment. There's a lot of mindfulness stuff in the world right now. I think that's kind of cool. Um, and then the other way of noticing is in retrospect, going back at the end of your day and journaling about, you know, was there any time where I felt a sense of flow or even a flow, a preliminary flow moment maybe was possible? Are there times during the day where things that were working for me very well and things that weren't working? And by keeping a journal, uh, what the psychologist noticed is once you start noticing, taking the time to notice in retrospect um, certain behaviors or certain uh, moods that you were in, you will reinforce your ability to, one, notice those moods, and they will happen more frequently. Um, and uh, there's, a, you know, there's an old saying, work isn't supposed to be fun, that's why they call it work. We totally disagree. Um, since work is the thing you're going to be doing 40 or 50 hours a week, um, in addition to everything else you do, it's one of the dominant activities and behaviors of your, of your day and your week, and so you should be enjoying it. Now, there's some startling statistics around this. Gallup does a poll every couple of years, and something like 70% of the people say they're deeply disengaged from the work they do, and another 15% say they're just disengaged. So we'll say 85% of American workers get up on Monday morning and say, I don't really want to go to work. It doesn't mean anything to me. This is startling in, in, in kind of its dysfunction. You don't want to be in that 85%. So one of the ways to notice that, that the work you're doing has some meaning is that it creates these flow states. So a flow journal is our, our sort of first recommendation. Um, the other thing about, about flow is it's about you know, it's about where your energy is going. Um, to a large extent, our experience of the world is sort of what's going on in our head, that part of your head that's always talking to you. If the part of your head that's talking to you is saying, hey, this is a really fun experience, or hey, I'm really learning a lot, or this is really interesting, then you're experiencing your day or that moment as meaningful. If the talking in your head is, I don't know what I'm doing this for, this, I have no context for this, this isn't interesting, then that's your reality. And so we, we've developed a little tool that's been pretty successful with students and, and with mid-career people and everybody. A lot of people talk about time management. Let's ma if I just manage my week better, you know, my time management, just the important stuff, not the urgent stuff, um, all that stuff's fine. 
but what we find is that it's it's a little bit cumbersome to keep track of <coughs> time and time management systems. And really what you're actually trying, what we think you're actually trying to keep track of is not so much did, how many hours did I spend on task A or B, but how did I feel about it? And so we, we reframed the time management thing to energy management. So the way you do this is take some, take some things from your flow journal for the week or just take your, uh, take your Google Calendar or whatever you've got, take it out, write down all of the repetitive meetings, activities, whatever that you do during the week. And not just, not just work things like, you know, I got the budget meeting, I got this, I got that, but oh, I take my kids to soccer games and I coach the Little League team on the weekend, any of your regular engagements. And then chart those engagements, uh, each, each, in, each specific engagement, and put them in order of, of, you know, beginning of the week, end of the week, and chart them in terms of, like, how energetic are those activities? And I don't mean this in a sort of, you know, California New Age energy thing. I'm just saying, you know, there's some stuff you do, and when you do it, you're done. You're just as, you're as energetic or more energetic than when you started. It kind of feeds you. It gives you energy. It feels purposeful. And there's other stuff you do, and you leave, leave the task, and you're drained. You're exhausted, or you're tired, or you're bored. Those are negative energy. Uh, tasks. So take those things and put them on a chart, and I'll show you what the chart looks like. And I just charted my week. It's just as an example for you to use. Here's my week. So to start out, um, uh, the beginning of the team, that, that, that long, tall thing that says flow next to it should have art class. Somehow that got moved off the slide, but it's over there. Art class is the first thing I do on Monday nights. It's a high energy activity. I have budget meetings. I'm the executive director of our program. I have to have a budget meeting every week. It's kind of a boring meeting. I feel a little bummed out when I'm done. I love my office hours. Those are lots of fun. Um, so that's a high energy activity. I love talking to my students. Uh, the faculty meeting is a funny one. Like when I, I sit with the faculty who are doing the robotic cars here at Stanford and tele-robotic medicine and um, amazing K-12 uh, program at the D school and other things. And when we're talking about that stuff, the faculty meetings are like this incredible intellectual salon, and I love them. And then every once in a while, we'll have a 25-minute conversation on who forgot to write down how many copies they made on the copier, and now the copier tally is out of order. And I'm thinking, this is the dumbest thing we could be talking about. I've got the smartest people in the world sitting around the table. And like, I'm just like, here's 20 bucks. At, you know, zero the tally. We'll start again. I don't care. So sometimes those are dumb meetings. I love walking around the campus. That's always fun for my a little bit of physical health. Teaching is fun. I don't like house cleaning. I love date night with my wife. And this was the weird one, master's coaching. I should like my master's students. We're, we admitted them, and they're my favorite students. And I coached them on their, um, on their thesis projects, and that wasn't working very well. So if you look at you do your chart like that, and you're looking for two things. You're looking for moments of flow. I've identified two office hours and, and my art class. Uh, my art class starts at 6.30. We're doing figure drawing. Sometimes by 9.30, I look up and I'm like, why is the model coming off the stage? Are we done? You know, what's, what's going on here? This is so much fun. Um, same thing with, with working with my students. I, I often go well over the time in my office hours because I just think the conversation with the students is so interesting and their growth and development is so interesting and that's why I'm here. So those are amazing. Um, master's coaching was a little bit odd in that it didn't, it didn't really work for me. And um, and so I came up with some strategies to fix that. And I'll show you those in a second. But just one, one little sidebar on this energy thing. I mean, if you really want to talk about energy in, in, in true engineering terms, the human body runs on 2,000 calories a day, 2,000 kilocalories a day of energy. That's how much food you eat. And we convert it at some level of efficiency into the energy that runs your body. So you would imagine that energy is distributed over the body, you know, sort of pro rata, you know, the size of the organs, but it's not. The human brain, which is only about two or three percent of the body, consumes 500 calories a day. It consumes 25 percent of all the energy that you that you uh, run on. And so what's really clear is that what you know, and, and if it consumed any more than that, probably the rest of the body couldn't function. So. We, we assume evolutionarily it's evolved to take as much energy as it can, but no more than uh, will be in balance. But since it's so disproportionate to the size and, and, and the, the weight of, of the organ itself, it must be important, right? And so this idea that what we actually spend our attention on, what we attend to, we're paying attention to this meeting, we're paying attention to um, something, we're paying attention to worrying, we're paying attention to negative thoughts, 
That is what the energy of your brain gets spent on. And so you want to be very aware of where are the positive and negative loads on that attention because that changes your perception of how your day is going. And I'm not talking about just thinking happy thoughts. I'm just talking about spend, being, being mindful of what you pay attention to, what you talk about in your head and in the world, because that is truly kind of how you represent reality to you. So in the engagement energy tool, you just notice what's consuming lots of your energies, what's generating more energy, so what's, what, what's, what's generative in the energy space, and then that simple chart you can use to redistribute or redefine your engagements. Like when I notice flow states, I double down on those. I'm, I'm actually going back to the studio tonight to do some more drawing because my wife's out of town. Um, and when I notice a negative thing, I try to uh, either uh, fix it or understand it. So in the case of, for instance, you notice that I was, you know, the, the budget meeting's not that positive, but I'm the executive director. I have to do budgets. I can't say I'm not going to do budgets. Sometimes, the, actually, the master stroke is to just say, I'm, I'm going to stop doing that task. But that's not always possible. So what I do now is I take my master's coaching and I put it between office hours and my workout. So, I mean, excuse me, the, my, my, um, my budget meeting being office hours and workout. And therefore, by surrounding a low energy thing with two high energy things, I negate its influence. And at the end of the week, I feel very positive that the week was useful. And the master's coaching thing, I realized, um, I was doing the coaching in our studio. It's called The Loft. It's a great place, but it's very messy. And I couldn't get the focus and attention I wanted in that place. So I didn't want to move it to my office because then we're in the professor's office and the conversation won't be natural. So I moved it to the terrace outside the coffee house. And now I buy the students a cup of coffee and we have our uh, engagement there. And just by changing the place, I've totally changed the way the energy shows up for me. And now it's a big positive. I'm sure it's a much more positive experience for the students as well because I'm more focused and more attentive. So you can change place, you can change sequence, you can change uh, a number of different things in, in, our, in the book and in the class. We have a thing we call the AEIO um, you know, method. You can change uh, activities, you can change engagements, you can change locations, that kind of a thing. Um, so take a look at that. But it's a really simple tool even just to bring to awareness what it is you're paying attention to. And then the last one I want to talk about is this notion of a gravity problem. I'm sure you have a friend, not you, but a friend who's been going, you've been going to coffee with or lunch with for the last couple of years, and they say things like, oh, my boss sucks, or I don't like my partner, or my job's terrible, or something. They, they have a whole litany of problems, and every time you get together with them, it's the same problems. And so well, there's a class of problems in the world we call gravity problems because you can't actually solve them. They're not solvable. Um, and when you run across a problem that's not solvable, so continuing to act on it, um, is a, it just causes a, a huge sense of disappointment and defeat. Dave would, my co-author Dave would say, you can't solve a problem you're not willing to have. So the first step in identifying whether it's a gravity problem or not. It's really to identify, is this a problem that's not even solvable? Because if it's not actionable in any way, it's just a circumstance like gravity. Dave was dealing with someone who was working in a family-run corporation. The name of the corporation was the last name of the family. And he was complaining, you know, I'm a, I'm a vice president of marketing, but I can never become the president of the company because I'm not a member of the family and my name's not on the door. And Dave said, you're absolutely right. You can never become the president of this company. Now, what do you want to do about that? Do you want is that a problem you want to try to solve, um, or is that just something you want to complain about? Because if it's just complaining, it's a gravity problem. Um, now we're not saying you can't fight city hall if you decide to fight city hall. If you decide to fight systemic racism, if you decide as a woman, you know that your mission is going to be to end sexism in the office, then it's no longer a gravity problem because it's a problem you're willing to take on, a problem you're willing to solve. But um, if you just want to work and you just want to be happy and you just want to get stuff done, the only the first step in gravity problems is accept. And I'm not suggesting that you accept systemic racism or anything like that. You just say, okay, this is a system that I have to deal with in the world. And now to be effective, I have to decide how I want to deal with it. So be careful of gravity problems because we see people sucked into these black holes over and over again and it really keeps them stuck in their lives. And the one thing we hear in all the workshops is that once you recognize what a gravity problem is, you learn how to reframe problems to work on them um, in a more effective manner, and you start looking at things like energy 
um, and engagement, um, you can really up the quality of the experience of your week and of your job and of your life, career, um, partnerships um, in a significant way. So I want to um, talk about, so I mentioned, so the, the actually, the, the, I'm sorry, so I meant to do the build here, the, the solution to gravity problems, of course, is uh, to start with the first step. And actually, we add accept in the, in the diagram of design thinking with respect to your life, we add the accept step first. Look, it's really simple. When we, when we sat down seven, eight, ten years ago to design this, I said, I think design thinking can be applied to the problem of, of an individual and a life rather than the problem of designing a new phone. And so we went looking to see if that were true because I didn't want to force the analogy. Um, so in this case, you, well, first of all, you start with accept. I'm, am, I, am I working on something I'm willing to work on? Um, you know, is there, is there a, a something in my life? Um, or is there a need in my life that I need to satisfy or solve? When um, we teach this idea of need finding, of using empathy to go out and understand what people need, we, see, we say a need is a gap between what you, what you want and the use or usability or the meaning of the thing you know, that, that you're trying to get to. So there's some kind of a gap. So we noticed um, with students and with other people who were thinking about their lives, the gap was this meaning gap. I'm doing stuff. I'm working. I have jobs. I don't know what it adds up to. And there's no structure in the world that's going to tell me that. I'm going to have to figure it out for myself. So all of the original ethnography we did on this problem with our students and with mid-career people and with encore career people, people who are retiring, and they want, but, they, but the people are retiring earlier now, and they're certainly retiring healthier now, and so they've got 10 or 20 years of productive, productive life in them you know, after they retire. And they go, what do I, I want to do something with this stuff, but I don't know how to get to the thing that's meaningful, the thing that gives me some kind of purpose. But the reason that I get up on Monday morning and say, I'm really looking forward to going into work rather than, oh, my God, do I have to spend another week doing that stuff? So the idea that we could turn empathy on ourselves, so we could have empathy for our own gaps, for our own the spaces between what we want and, and, and this idea of meaning. And that we could also turn our empathy on the world. Like, what does the world need from me? Dave will say, when your greatest, when your greatest gift, you know, is given to the world in a way where the world really wants it, then you have the perfect match, right? Um, and just because I'm passionate about something doesn't mean the world wants to pay me for it. Just because I'm excited about something doesn't mean that the world is excited about what I want. And so one of the things we tried, to, we tried to see is, would it be possible to use empathy for ourselves and empathy for the world to, to close this gap on meaning? To do that, we realized, well, there's these gravity problems, and there's things that pe keep people stuck. We're going to have to reframe all of this stuff. But that's perfect for the defined part of, of the problem. And then we know that if you have lots and lots of ideas, you're going to have better things to choose from. There's tons and tons of data, so we evolved this idea that there's not one of you, there's at least three. We're going to ideate on three versions of our life, never one. We're going to ideate and mind map and brainstorm and do those well, teach you the way designers do those, so that they're highly productive uh, and outcome-driven um, activities, not just, oh, we had a lot of ideas and now I don't know what to do with them. So we knew we could do that. And then fundamentally, since you're trying to create the future of you, and the future is unknowable, you don't know if the thing you want to do will be successful. You don't know if you even really want to do it. And this notion that you had to pick something, go all in, and then if it didn't work, oh, well, you didn't get the best outcome, just seemed like that's not the way designers approach the problem. Now, I was at Apple a long time ago um, when we went to the first laptops. So uh, I wasn't there when they were doing the phone, but if you read about um, in Steve, Steve uh, Jobs' biography by Walter Isaacson, if you read about the story of the phone, you know, they. They prototyped the phone hundreds of times, and they showed it to Steve three times, and three times, he, twice he turned it down, and the third time he said it was good enough. Um, so this notion that they were going to work on one singular version, it's just not the way designers work. They were working on multiple ideas for the interaction, the interface, the screen. You know, the original one didn't have a fingerprint sensor, but it was all the things that they put in there, they had no idea what the outcome would be when they started. They just knew that they wanted something in Steve's parlance that would be insanely great and would reinvent the category of, of phones. And so 
the willingness to sort of build and test your way forward is what's the core principle in design thinking. And then when we ported that over to designing your life, it just makes perfect sense. What's an information interview? It's a prototype of you talking to someone who might be doing something that you are interested in doing. They're actually you in your future. They've been doing it for years. You've been just, you've been just thinking about what maybe that might be something I'm interested in. Having what we call a prototype interview with someone and doing it well to get their story should leave some resonance in you. You'll hear a story that either you know, rings a bell in your, in your heart or your mind or doesn't. And that's a great piece of information about whether that future would work for you. A prototype experience, going to shadow somebody for a day, doing a one-week, uh, you know, kind of internship, quote, internship, working on a project together is a great way to discover whether that career path or that activity set um, is something that you're interested in. So this notion of building your way forward. David Kelly says we build to think. We make something so that we provoke the world to say, this is a possible future. What do you think? And everybody talks about it. And then we get new ideas. Is a, is a wonderful way to prototype your life. And it avoids the possibility that you'll go all in on something, discover it's not what you thought it would be, and, uh, and then be disappointed and have to pivot or reset. And that can be pretty costly if, you, you know, if you're far down the path. Uh, it's been wonderful to go out and do workshops on this stuff with the Stanford Alumni Association. I get to meet tons of really wonderful alums, and they all have wonderful stories. Some of the cautionary stories I hear are, and it's, it's kind of paradoxical, wow, I'm super successful. I'm partner at the firm, pick any firm, law firm, business consulting firm, whatever. I'm making, you know, lots of money, seven figures. Um, I'm, you know, able to support a fantastic lifestyle for my, for my family, and I'm miserable. And one woman said to me, it steals a little piece of my soul every day to go to work. And I said, well, that can't be. That doesn't sound healthy. <laughs> let's, let's work on that. And she said, no, you don't understand. I'm stuck. Um, every, I'm, you know, I'm the youngest woman at the firm. I'm the, the only woman partner at the firm. I need to do this you know, to uphold this image. Uh, I need to do this because, it's, you know, because I believe in it. But I hate the work I'm doing. Uh, and we built a lifestyle that requires you know, this kind of money and everything else. And so, you know, I'm, I'm meeting people, in other words, that haven't had a chance to stop on this. They're very successful people, obviously, um, but the success has trapped them into a, a situation and a lifestyle that they never, they never wanted. They never thought about it very much. They just sort of went for the next bright, shiny accomplishment because they're smart and, and people full of capacity. They were successful in getting the thing they never asked themselves, do I really want this? And so the earlier you can start engaging in this design process and saying, hey, before I, before I decide you know, that being a partner at the law firm is what I really, really want, I probably ought to go shadow a partner, maybe have a conversation with a couple of associates, take a few people out to lunch and dinner. Somebody must know somebody who can introduce me to someone at one of these situations. Or do I want to be a professor? Do I want to be you know, all these things? There's a, a famous... Um, uh, science fiction writer William Gibson, who I love, and he's got a famous quote, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Somebody is, you can't know anything about your personal future, but someone is probably living a very similar analogous future, and they're already doing it. They've been doing it for years, and so they represent a little piece of you in the future. The ability to learn to prototype your way into these experiences, try things in a really low threat situation. Dave and I say, set the bar low, clear it, do it again, design these information interviews, these information prototypes, um, and information ex prototype experiences to learn how to um, imagine your future. It, it's so critical. And the other thing that's true, you know, in product design, um, I'll do a bunch of ethnography and research, and I'll come back with a product that everybody in the, in the group I'm working with said they wanted, and then I'll show them the new prototype, and then they'll say, oh, now that we see that, I've changed my mind. That's not what I want anymore. And it's very frustrating <laughs> as a designer or an engineer to hear that the, the customer keeps changing their mind. But what happened in the moment when I showed them the thing that they said that they wanted, when they actually realized what it is possible, what is possible in this new future, of course they changed their mind because their needs changed because now they know something is possible that they, didn't, they could not have imagined. And, and that's exactly what we want to happen, in fact. It's not frustrating. 
is this notion of when I go out in the world, I engage the world in radical collaboration with curiosity to designers' mindsets. I've reframed the problem, and I'm looking for people who are living in my future, and I'm talking to them, and I'm engaging them, and I'm even prototyping little versions of what, what it would be like if I did that. And I'm having the embodied experience of that, and I'm having the, the, the physical experience and the intellectual experience of that, something Dave and I call narrative resonance. Is that story my story? Do I hear myself in that? When, when two tuning forks are in the same room and they're on the same pitch, you, you ring one, the other one rings in sympathy. So do I have an, a sympathetic reson, resonance with the future that I'm exploring? And if I do, and if I find myself in states of flow every once in a while as I, as I work into this or prototype or build my way forward, um, then I know I'm on the right track. Anyway, I want to leave some time for questions, so let me just kind of hit the takeaways. I, I believe we have demonstrated through our research and through the three or 4,000 students that on campus and off that you can, in fact, design your life. And kind of, kind of you have to because if you don't design it, it's going to get designed for you in some ad hoc process, and then you're just going to be responding to life rather than trying to sort of manage and, and wayfind it. Um, for most people, passion is a poor starting point because 80% of us don't have one. Um, if you, again, if you have one, awesome, go for it. Uh, that will be a, uh, uh, an organizing principle, but you will still prototype interview and prototype experience your way forward because you still don't know your future any better than we do. Um, a flow journal is one way of noticing. Uh, flow and energy engagements uh, are, are really important things to notice. It's not the time you spend on something, it's the energy you spend on something. Our attention, uh, which comes from this funny three pounds of, of gooey stuff in our brain, our attention is what consumes our energy. We, we spend our time and attention on the things we are talking to ourselves about. So be very, very aware of what you're spending your time and attention on. Dave has a phrase, and it's a little bit, um, a little bit maybe trite, but he says, if you don't like your reality, change your mind. Actually, it's a phrase that comes from his mentor. Um, uh, it's not as easy as that, obviously, when, you know, stuff will happen in reality. We, we like to say bias to action because that's the designer's mindset rather than bias to planning. Um, planning is great, but um, there's an old military expression, no plan of battle survives first contact with the enemy. And I would argue no plan for your life is going to survive first contact with reality. Stuff will happen in reality. You will have to deal with it. Things you will find, you know, things, bad things will happen, disappointing things will happen. Um, opportunities that you wanted will not be available to you, so you will have to replan with action in real time. But what you pay attention to and how you frame those experiences, the positive and the negative ones, is how you will experience meaning in your life. It's not a zero-sum game, and you're never too late. You can reset this counter at any point and start over. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, take a few minutes, as, as time permits, to, to ask Bill a few questions that have come up, and we invite you to submit additional questions. We'll get to as many as we can in the 10 minutes uh, that we have. So, uh, so first of all, Bill, one, one uh, note that we got from, uh, from the audience, which I liked, is someone said that this last hour has been a state of flow for them, so, so um, oh, that's it, was, great. it was nice <laughs> to hear that. Um, so I think one question that came up earlier uh, in, in the webinar, which I think is important to address and kind of an elephant in the room potentially in, in as you think about careers, what is the role of money in this uh, scheme? Yeah. You know, this is one of the most re well-researched topics in psychology and positive psychology particularly. You know, does money make you happy? How much money do you have to have in order to be happy? And is, is the pursuit of money, which, which you know, cons also includes money gives you capacity to do different things, is that important? Is that what makes you happy? Um, and particularly for people who are knowledge workers, folks that are, you know, working not uh, on an assembly line where you get paid by the number of parts you assemble, but, but are doing work that's cognitive work or some other kind of work. Um, the research is very, very clear. Once you have enough money, and enough means that um, you're not worried about your bills, you're not worried about, um, you know, your future, you can, you can save enough money to, make, to feel like you'll have what you need. Once you have enough, incre incremental amounts after that, uh, lead to absolutely no more happiness or sense of purpose in your life. Um, so, you know, if you're Warren Buffett, 
it doesn't matter after you've got a couple of hundred thousand dollars and you can live in the house you want to live in and you can you know do everything else having a yacht and everything else does not increase Warren Buffett's happiness at all so this notion that you kind of pursue money for happiness is a really toxic notion now if you don't have enough or if you're insecure that the, that the flow of money might be interrupted because your industry is in turmoil or something else those are all real problems and those you can work on but um, there's a thing uh, psychologists call the hedonic treadmill. This hedonism is the search of pleasure, right? And the hedonic treadmill is this treadmill of pleasure. So I, I go to work and I'm happy for a while, then I get bored. So they, I get a raise and a promotion. Now I'm happy again. And then about roughly about six to eight months later, I'm back to the exact same state of, of whatever my, my, my rest state was, and I'm bored. So my conclusion, of course, is, well, it was nice to get a raise, but it wasn't enough. If I had more, then I'd be happier. So then I get another raise, I get another promotion, I end up partner at the law firm, I'm making you know, $650,000 base with a $2 million bonus, and I'm no happier than I was when I was the associate you know, making $150,000 a year. In fact, I'm more miserable because I have more constraints on my, my behaviors and my time. So it's absolutely clear money does not make you happy. You, of course, have to be in a position where your you know, safety, security, and you know, basic needs are met. Once that has occurred, Take money off the table um, and go for purpose. Uh, uh, Dan, Dan, Price, Dan Pink's book, Dan Pink's a fantastic um, guy that we worked, have done some work with. He wrote, written a bunch of different books, but in the book Drive, where he talks about what motivates people to work hard, um, all the research says it's autonomy, mastery, and purpose. You have to have purpose for your work. Mastery means you're learning all the time. And autonomy means you're, you're, you're deciding how to get the, the tasks done that you want to do. It doesn't mean you work for yourself just means you're, you're not being micromanaged. If you have those three things, money will, money will not make you happy. Search for things that actually do. Um, yeah, there's another comment that came in from one of the listeners that said there are two amounts of money, enough and not enough. So I think, uh, I think that's a, a nice summary of that. Uh, uh, By the way, people notion. who win the lottery, who win millions and millions of dollars, within 18 months go back to the exact same amount of satisfaction and happiness in their life. It makes no difference at all. If they were a miserable person, they remain miserable. If they were a happy person, they remain happy. Whatever your set point is, money doesn't change it. Um, all right, so we're getting a lot more questions, but we'll pick one. I don't think we'll have uh, time for more than one question. Um, in the design thinking process, there's a lot of emphasis put on getting feedback and testing with users, mm -hmm. testing your prototypes. How do you do that in this uh, situation? You've prototyped a number of, of lives or a number of activities, and how do you get feedback? Mm -hmm. And maybe related to that, what are some metrics that you use to evaluate the success of your, yeah. your different? So the, quickly, the, the, the feedback mechanism is, again, it's empathy for yourself. How did this feel to me? I did this little prototype. I shadowed this doctor for a day, or I, I went and I did a one-week you know, unpaid project with this group. How did I feel about that? What was my internal state, both my emotional state, my intellectual state? That's one, that's one measure. And then two, how was my work received? It's unlikely that you're going to be happy and feel like you're thriving if you are not um, excellent at the things you do. So you, you, you have your own strengths and weaknesses. We all do. If I'm working from my strengths and if the work product that I deliver is well accepted, people, well, that's exceptional, we really like working with you, then I'm getting two kinds of feedback. I enjoy the work and the people enjoy my output. That's in the, in the work domain. But it would, it would include any other domain. I mean, you're unlikely to be happy if you're not good at something. So you're looking for where in the world will the things that I'm strong at be well received. And if I'm looking for money for those things, it's in the marketplace. So if I'm in the world of art and, and design, uh, then it's about um, having people who, who appreciate the quality of my, my art or my, my, my work in that domain. So I need the feedback loop from the world to say, oh yeah, the thing that you're doing that you're really good at, we want that too. There, there's an acceptance on the other side. Otherwise, you're, you know, you're, the, un, you're the unpaid Artist, artist in poverty, that's fine. You can choose to be that person. There's nothing wrong with that. But you just have to accept that the world doesn't want your art. Most artists don't care about that problem, so that's okay. Um, but if, you, if you're planning on this being something that supports you, and remember, there's your vocation and there's your avocation. Vocation is what you do for money. Avocation is what you do for meaning. You may decide to make those the same thing. That's a kind of modern idea. My grandfather, who came over from Wales, worked at the National Biscuit Company, Nabisco, making cookies for 40 years, you know, in the union, working hard, came home. His, that was just making money. The meaning in his life was his family 
he was a member of the Elks, he was a member of a, you know, his church. That's what, that's what drove the meaning in his life. So this notion that you're going to get it all in one place is a very modern idea. But in, in any case, pick the place where you want to get the feedback from and then listen carefully. Is the world responding to the things I'm offering? Um, what was the second part? Um, Just, metrics. Yeah, and so the metrics would be um, I'm doing my flow journal, I'm noticing flow states are popping up more often. Um, I'm doing my energy mapping and I'm noticing that I'm leaving most weeks with a fairly high energy reserve and I'm excited and enthusiastic about the next thing. And the other metric is, is the world, if you're in the, in the vocation thing, is the world paying me what I think I need to make in order for this to be meaningful work for me? Um, so as, as long as, you know, I'm getting paid enough. You know, I, I, we do run into, I'm, uh, you know, at these workshops, I'm a CEO, make a lot of money, but you know, I really want to be a poet. I go, great, you can be, a, the, 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 as far as I know, there is nothing stopping you from being a poet. Oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I want to be a poet, and I still need to make seven figures because I got the house and the Teslas and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, well, that's A, your gravity problem. Or B, maybe you should try rap. Maybe you're the next, you know, Dr. Dre. You don't look like it to me, <laughs> frankly, but the only seven-figure poet poets I know uh, uh, write, write rap music. So if you're not willing to do poetry on the market's terms, then my suggestion is keep your CEO day job and go out to poetry slams at night and open mic night nights at night and get your avocation, you know, to fulfill that part of you that wants to speak in poetic terms. But don't don't blame the world that there are no seven figure, you know, seven figure salaries for poets because that's just gravity, dude. Um, great, wonderful. Uh, so this was very informative. As I said, we had lots and lots of questions and interest. Um, all of you will be receiving a recording of this webinar within a week so that you can review it again and, uh, and try and, and practice some of these things. And as uh, we mentioned, we would love to see as many of you as are interested uh, here with us in June to try and get some additional practice with the design thinking and designing your life activities. Uh, have a very good rest of your day, and thank you for joining us.